I'm going to trade my earth with home for a better one, bright and fair. The rice left to prepare a mansion for the children in the air. I'm going to join him in the land where to know sorrows can be found. And when I receive my mansion and my robe, oh, no, you want a mansion. Thank you for being a part of our online worship service. We're grateful and thankful to God that he has blessed us one more week that we might come together to worship him in spirit and in truth. I want to thank those who were able to come to our parking lot worship service on last week. And also I want to thank those who were part of our online experience. We had our highest number of views this past uh, week and we thank God that many have tuned in. We're beginning to recognize not just this church, but also the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we hope, trust, and pray that every time we come before you, that there is a relevant word that will, for some, will move you out of your too easy composure and cause you to ask, "What must I do in order for my soul to be saved?" Then there are others who are going through the struggles and the vicissitudes and the troubles of life. We hope, trust, and pray that every time we stand behind this sacred desk that we call the pulpit, that something is said that will cause you to live a little closer to the cross. With that being said, let us go to God in a word of prayer. Father, we thank you so much for what you have done for us on this day. We thank you for your goodness, your grace, and all of your mercy. We thank you, Father, for bringing us to this point in time in our life bringing us to this another Lord's Day where we may come together to worship you in spirit and in truth. We ask that you forgive us of our sins and our transgressions, our shortcomings and our shortfalls. God, we ask that you continue and we know that you will allow the Holy Spirit to still work with us to lead us and guide us in all righteousness. Father, you've declared that you've given us all things that pertain to godliness and all things that pertain to righteousness. And we pray that we will hold to your unchanging hand. We know, God, that there are some who are sick. There are some who are not feeling well. There are some who have been afflicted by this invisible disease that we call COVID. Father, we ask that you touch them as only you can. Father, we also pray for our president and his wife who has been touched by COVID. 
God, we don't pray because of political parties, but you have told us to pray for the officials of our nation. And let us never become so political divisive. Let us never become so entangled with the world that we cannot lean on your word. Whether they be sinner or saint, God, Democrat or Republican, conservative or liberal, you told us to pray. Because we believe in the power of prayer, God, we know that you're going to work everything out. Now be, O oh God, with these, your people who are getting ready to listen to your word. Allow me, God, to go deep down into your well of wisdom and knowledge. Draw me up a field of man that I may disperse unto your people, thus saith the Lord. Now, God, we ask that you guide us, guard us, and keep us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Again, we want to thank you so much for joining us on today. We ask that you get your Bible or uh, turn on your uh, app or however you read the Word of God and look with us at Daniel chapter 3. That is Daniel <coughs> chapter 3. Daniel chapter 3, beginning at verse number 12 and concluding at verse number 18. Although it is on the screen, we still encourage you as we're moving through this message to get your Bible that you might read along with us. Daniel chapter 3, beginning at verse number 12 and concluding at verse number 18. Now the Bible says, There are certain Jews whom thou hast set over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, have not regarded thee. They serve not thy gods, that's a little g, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar in his rage and fury commanded to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Then they brought these men before the king. Nebuchadnezzar spake and said unto them, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? Do you serve, do not you serve my gods? nor worship the golden image which I have set up. Now, if you be ready that at what time you hear the sound of the cornet, the flute, the harp, the sackbut, the psaltery, the, dul the dulcimer, and all kinds of music, you fall down and worship the image which I have made. Well, but if you worship not, you shall be cast the same hour into the midst of a burning fiery furnace. And who is that God that shall deliver you out of my hands? Verse 16, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer thee in this matter. If it be so, watch this, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of thine hand, O king. Verse number 18, but if not, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. I will now read from the New Living Translation, beginning at verse number 12 of Daniel chapter 3. But there are some Jews, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, whom you have put in charge of the province of Babylon. They pay no they pay no attention to you, your majesty. They refuse to serve your gods and do not worship the gold statue you have set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar flew into a rage and ordered that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be brought before him. When they were brought in, Nebuchadnezzar said to them, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you refuse to serve my gods or to worship the golden statue I've set up? I'll give you one more chance to bow down and worship the statue I've made when you hear the sound of the musical instruments. But if you refuse, you will be thrown immediately into the blazing furnace, and then the God will be able, and then what God will be able to rescue you from my power? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied, this is verse 16, O Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God whom we serve is able to save us. He will rescue us from your power, your majesty. 
But even if he does not, we want to make it clear to you, your majesty, that we will never serve your gods or worship the golden statue you have set up. From Daniel chapter 3, verses 12 through 18, I want to talk to you briefly from the subject, the price of praise. The price of praise. Before I get into this message, I want to warn you that it will cost you something to praise and worship God will cost you something to give your life totally to God. And so we're getting ready to take a peek in on Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, these three Hebrew boys who was willing to pray to pay the price to praise and worship God. And as we began to look at their story, I want you to insert yourself into their shoes and into their lives. And I want you to understand that whenever you make up in your mind that you are going to put God first in your life, there is a price to be paid. Whenever you make up in your mind that come what may in your life, it does not matter who talks about you, who ostracize you, or who, who, who ostracize you, cuts you down or cuts you off and criticize you, you're still going to serve the Lord. There is a price to be paid. In, this, in demanding that these officials fall down before the image of gold, Nebuchadnezzar was demanding a public display of recognition and submission to his absolute authority and power in the kingdom. The fact that the officials were commanded not only to fall down before the image, but also to worship, it indicates that the image had both religious and political significance. And since no specific God is mentioned, it is therefore inferred that Nebuchadnezzar was not honoring one of the gods of Babylon, but rather was instituting a new form of religious worship with his image at the center. The officials summons by Nebuchadnezzar were summoned by Nebuchadnezzar to assemble in the plains of Dura to receive orders as the king's heralds were to go out through the city and tell everybody that it was time to bow down and worship and there was a new god in town. Elaborate preparations in the construction of the image of gold made this occasion both aesthetically appealing and musically appealing. The musical accompaniment to make this occasion emotionally moving, the orchestra had been called into town. The wind instruments, the reed instruments, and the string instruments were now getting ready to blow for Nebuchadnezzar. However, Nebuchadnezzar had forgotten that there is still a God that sits high and looks low. Nebuchadnezzar wanted his heralders to go and tell everybody that failure to comply to the command to worship this image was penalized by sudden death by being thrown into the fiery furnace. And by chapter 3 and verse number 7, he is overwhelmed, overwhelmed by the king's commands, the awesomeness of the image and the sounds of music. The assembled officials fall down and worship this image of gold. In this way, the officials and the people that they represented, they wanted them to recognize that Nebuchadnezzar was now the new God in town. But by the time you get to chapter 3 and verse number 8, someone else steps onto the scene. There are three Hebrew boys by the name of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And the Chaldeans came and ratted them out and told Nebuchadnezzar, that these three Hebrew boys refused to bow down before his image. They were accusers of these three Hebrew boys. And let me share this with you. Whenever you decide to stand up for God, there will always be those who will accuse you maliciously. The Bible speaks of Satan as an accuser of the brothers. Whenever you try to do us right, whenever you stand on the word of God, there will always be somebody, some coward and some critic who will criticize what you're doing, but it does not matter who criticize or ostracize, you still need to stand up for what is right and stand on the word of God. 
I tell you this all the time. When you're standing on the word of God, it is not about standing or moving with the crowd. It is not about a popularity contest. When you stand on the word of God, there's a price to be paid when you praise God. There's a price to be paid when you stand for what's right. There's a price to be paid when you're willing to stand away and alone from the crowd. When you stand for a square on the word of God, people will accuse you of things that aren't even true. Some court advisors were quick to bring this accusation against the Jews. The word translated denounce is a strong meaning. It means to tear them into pieces. They denounce what Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were doing. And these accusations were so severe that they were intended to destroy the reputation of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. How many of you know that when you stand for what is right and you don't listen to the crowd and you're willing to be an outlier and stand all by yourself, some people will start malicious rumors about you, malicious rumors about your family, malicious rumors about your children, and it is designed to tear you down but what you have to do is keep your eyes keep your focus on Jesus Christ who is the author and the finisher of our faith and remember that truth will outlive a lie every time so they accused these young men before Nebuchadnezzar the accusers were motivated by jealousy and they referred to the fact that Nebuchadnezzar had set some Jews over the affairs of the province of Babylon, chapter 3 and verse number 12. See, some people will accuse you of things because they're jealous of you. The jealousy evidently sprang from the king's recognition of the unusual ability that these young men had. When God gives you an ability to do great things in the kingdom of God, it would seem that everybody in the kingdom would celebrate the ability that God has given you. But more often than not, people become jealous of your ability. And what I have come to understand and what I've come to learn is that there is no need in me being jealous of anyone else. I just need to use the ability and the talent that God gave me. And if I can use the ability and the talent that God gave me, then I can celebrate what God has given somebody else. All of us cannot have the same abilities and the same talents in the kingdom of God. If all of us had the same ability and the same talent, then many things would go undone. That's why the Bible speaks of our several abilities, which means we do different things, but when we bring it all together, it is for the honor and the glory of God. And so they were jealous because these three Hebrew boys, usually the subjugated people, such as the Jewish captives, were normally relegated to positions of servitude and not elevated to positions of authority. So the high positions of some Jews were resented by others. The counselors sought to find favor with the king by contrasting the three Jews' refusal to bow down to the image with their own worship of it. Interestingly, they accused Daniel's three friends, but they did not accuse Daniel. See, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they had made up in their mind, I'm getting ready to preach it now, they had made up in their mind that they were going to serve God, but they also understood that there was a price to be paid. And when there's a price to be paid, you had better stand firm on the word of God. They understood, first of all, that as they serve God, and I want you to understand this, and I'm going to slow down and teach this, when you make up in your mind that you're going to serve God, there is a promise of persecution. Whenever you and I stand before God and we talk to the Holy Spirit and we share and tell the Holy Spirit, I'm getting ready to do more in the kingdom of God, then along with that proclamation comes a promise of persecution. It would be wonderful if we could serve God and not be persecuted, but that is not how God grows us. God grows us and matures us in the midst of persecution. 
we as God's children should expect the furnace of persecution if we are wholly dedicated to Jesus Christ. Peter put it this way in 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse number 12. He says, think it not strange concerning the fiery trials which is to try you. The world hates us and Satan sees to it that the furnaces of our lives are turned up seven times hotter. These three Hebrew boys could have made excuses and gone along with the crowd, but instead they stood with one another and with the Lord and trusting God to glorify and manifest himself in their, in their life, whether it be by life or by death. Second Timothy chapter 3 and verse number 12 reminds us that if we're going to live godly in this world, we're going to suffer persecution, persecution to a child of God is not optional, it is mandatory, it is obligatory, it is set and fixed. Christians, we have to expect persecution. God promised it. In Philippians chapter 1 and verse number 29, he says, For unto you it is given in the behalf of Christ not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for his sake. When we believe on Jesus Christ, there's a price we have to pay. We not only share in his glory, but we also share in his suffering. Let me help some of you as, 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 as God's children before I take my seat, as I get ready to take my seat. You can't allow the devil to think that every negative thing that happens to you, it is because God is upset with you. There are things that God allow us to go through that he uses to mature us because in order for God to get us to another level of faith walk with him, we have to master this level before he carries us to the next level. And the only way for him to carry us from this level to another level is to allow persecution and the storms of life and the furnaces of life and the fiery darts of life so that when we master them, we move to another level. Because watch this, watch this, I want you to get this closely. There is a devil for every level that you go through in life. For every level of your life that God takes you through, there is a devil. Many times, here's where we make, this, here, here's where we make the mistake. We are fighting the devil on level one, and that is the only one that we have prepared for. And by the time we get to level two, it's a new devil, and we don't succeed on level two because we still have a level one mentality. You have to understand the higher you go up in your faith walk with God, the more intense the attacks become on your life. See, when nobody knew your name, when nobody called your name, when nobody knew where you sat at in worship service, when nobody knew how good you could sing, how good you could preach, how good you could pray, how good you could read the scripture, nobody bothered you. On your job, when you sat by yourself and didn't bother anybody on your job, nobody bothered you. But all of a sudden, a supervisor began to recognize you. You began to get awards. You began to get recognition. And people began to see you. That's when people and the devil got busy in your life. What are you saying, preacher? For every level in your life, there is a devil. And you have to prepare for the devils in your life. And when God is getting ready to move you to another level, you got to put your battle regalia on and realize that when you get to another level, there's a a whole new devil that you got to contend with. But God would not take you to another level if he has not already given you the strength to defeat the devil that's on the level that God is taking you to. And so he says, listen, we not only share in his glory, but we also share in his suffering. The apostle wished that the Philippians to consider their suffering for Christ as an honor, to rejoice in their suffering. As Christians, we must understand that there is a promise of persecution. However, our persecutions are not in vain. It is not, a, it is not futile or worthless, but rather it is to produce fruit 
filled children of God, God desires that his fruit of righteousness be worked out in our lives. And one way in which he does it is through persecution. Of course, it is not instantaneous because it takes time for fruit to come to fruition. Let me preach to somebody. It takes time for fruit to grow. It takes time for the seed to be planted in the ground. It takes time for the seed to germinate. It takes time for the seed to sprout. It takes time for the sprout to turn into a tree. It takes time for the sprout to turn into a vine. It takes time for fruit to come on the vine. It takes time for the fruit to mature. It takes time for the fruit to mature and be plucked off the vine. What are you saying? That our Christian walk, it takes maturity and God has to plant that seed of righteousness in our life and if we hold to God's unchanging hand, it will produce righteous fruit. See, real faith does not begin to show itself. As we look at Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, real faith does not begin to show itself until it's put in the fiery furnace. James said in, the, in his letter in James chapter 1 and verse number 12, blessed is the man who preserves under trials. For once he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life which the Lord has promised to those who love him. See, as a child of God, we will have difficult days. As a child of God, you'll have sad situations to struggle with. you have rough roads to walk on. As a child of God, you'll have high hills to climb. As a child of God, you'll have low valleys to go through. As a child of God, you'll have difficult people to deal with. As a child of God, you'll have foolish family members to contend with. As a child of God, you'll have cantankerous Christians to worry with. All of these situations and circumstances are merely conduits or instruments of persecution, but they will get out of you what like nothing else can get out of you. They will pull something out of you that joy can't pull out of you. See, sometimes it takes the persecution, the squeezing of the persecution to squeeze us so hard that something is squeezed out of us that would not be squeezed out of us if we were standing on the mountaintop. See, sometimes we need a valley experience to get some good out of us. So don't you ever, don't you ever berate the things that you go through but bless them. Don't you rebuke them but rejoice in them. Don't you criticize your trouble but you commend it. Don't you complain about it but you compliment it. Don't exclude it but embrace it. Don't reject it but rejoice it. You need to learn how to rejoice in your persecution. Why? Because your persecution has a purpose connected to it. And that's why you have to pay the price. That's why you should never be afraid to pay the price for your persecution because God has a purpose for your persecution. There's a price to pay when you praise God. Some may wonder why would you pay such a high cost of being talked about and scandalized and scorned. But if they only knew what God has brought you through, <laughs> they wouldn't talk about the high price that you're willing to pay. If they knew your story, then they'd know you'd pay anything because God has been so good to you. Because you could never repay God for the blessings that he's placed on your life. Then look at, look, look, look real quick. I want to look at verse number 13. See, <laughs> Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego was willing to pay the price. The Bible says in verse 13, then Nebuchadnezzar in his rage and fury commanded to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And then they brought these men before the king. Nebuchadnezzar spake and said unto them, is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? They said, yeah, it's true. We will not serve your golden image. See, they had been accused. Now their faith is being attacked. When the king heard that these three refused to bow down, the Bible says he became furious. The high esteem with which, with which these men had previously held by Nebuchadnezzar did not exempt them from the submission of his authority. Nebuchadnezzar, although he did not pass 
immediate judgment on them. He gave them another chance to bow down, but their answer was still the same. We will not bow down to you. The king impressed upon them the importance of their submission to him, and he said, now, if you don't bow down, then what I'm going to do is throw you into the fiery furnace, and your death will be immediately. Nebuchadnezzar considered himself above all gods because he asked, what God will be able to rescue you from my hand? Again, this shows that he claimed absolute authority in both political and the religious realm. He was challenging any god to circumvent his authority, but Nebuchadnezzar must have forgotten about the God that brought them through the Red Sea. Nebuchadnezzar must have forgotten about the God who had caused the plagues upon Pharaoh and caused him to let his people go. Nebuchadnezzar must have forgotten about the God who led them by a pillar of fire by night and a cloud by day. Nebuchadnezzar forgot that there was a God who did not answer to any God, but he was a God above all gods. And so the matter then became a conflict between Nebuchadnezzar and God and not Nebuchadnezzar, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. If I could just pull the car over to the side of the road for just a minute, I promise to leave it running. But let me tell you something. When people are criticizing you, you have to understand it is not contention between you and them when they talk about you as a child of God it is no longer between you and them it is now between them and God that's why you all you need to do is just keep on praising God all you need to do is keep on praying to God all you need to do is keep on singing God's praises all you need to do is focus on God because when they try to destroy you it is no longer between you and them it is now between God God in them, and I declare by the glory of Jesus Christ, they can't defeat God, and since they can't defeat God, they cannot defeat you. The victory is already yours. That's why the Bible says the battle is not yours. It is the Lord's. Whenever you're in the hands of the Lord and doing everything that God wants you to do, you don't have to fight everybody that wants to fight you. You don't have to answer to every criticism, every lie, and every rumor that is told on you because it is no longer between you and them. It's now between them and God. And when you put them in the hand of God, you had better pray for them because God will only let so much happen to his child. That's what I wish some people would understand and believe. You have to be careful how you deal with a child of God. So Nebuchadnezzar said, listen, I'm getting ready to put you in a fiery furnace, and I don't know what God you think is big enough to get you out of that. <laughs> See, you have to be careful how you challenge God. Be careful how you challenge God. Because these three Hebrew boys showed absolute confidence in God. They stated that their God was greater than Nebuchadnezzar and was able to deliver them from Nebuchadnezzar's judgment in a display of his superior power. The words that they use are so powerful and so profound. They said, the God we serve. See, I don't care what's going on in your life. You ought to walk through life by saying, the God I serve is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all I could ask or even think. So they said their words were the God we serve. It shows that they recognized God's authority was greater than the authority claimed by Nebuchadnezzar. Though they were employed by Nebuchadnezzar, they were empowered by God. One more time, come here. They were employed by Nebuchadnezzar, but they were empowered by God. I don't care who you are employed by, you need to recognize who you are empowered by, and as long as you are empowered by God, you got to pay the price to praise him because as long as you are empowered by God, he has put a hedge of protection around you that no devil in hell can get to you. When you are empowered by God, you are no longer the victim. You are now victor. When you are empowered by God, you walk with thunder in your feet. You have lightning in your voice. Why? Because you are empowered by God. 
So their, their, their God demanded obedience. I'm getting ready to close now, but their God demanded obedience and had forbidden them to worship any other gods. One who obeys God is not presuming when he expects God to protect and deliver him. Obeying God was more important than life to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So they said if God chooses not to deliver us, they would still obey him. Therefore, they refused to serve Nebuchadnezzar's God or worship the image that he made. They said, listen, God may not, but we know that he is able. They'd rather die than switch. See, they'd rather listen to God than listen to man. And I need to tell you, you need to listen to God rather than listen to man. For man will tell you some things that are contrary to the word of God. Philosophy says, think your way out. Science says, invent your way out. Legislators say, vote your way out. Politicians say, spend your way out. Government says, socialize your way out. The liquor store says, drink your way out. The weed man says, smoke your way out. The psychiatrist says, talk your way out. Money says, buy your way out. Demonstrators say, shout your way out. Rioters say, fight your way out. Industry says, work your way out. Satan says, there is no way out. But God says, I am the way out. And so when the devil puts you in the fiery furnace, you just need to know that God is your way out. You just got to be willing to pay the price. Yes, they'll talk about you, but you just pay the price. Well, preacher, how can I pay the price? You can pay the price because Jesus paid it a long time ago. All he's asking you to do is just hold to his unchanging hand out on Calvary's cross, out on Calvary's Calvary's cross, Jesus paid the cost. He died for a debt that he did not owe because we owed a debt that we could not pay out on Calvary's cross. That's where the sinner and the Savior came together out on Calvary's cross. It is where we receive the grace of God out on Calvary's cross. It is where Jesus looked up into the heavens and said, Father, it is finished. And then he dropped his head between the locks of his shoulders out on Calvary's cross. It is where his mother Mary cried and prayed for her son Jesus out on Calvary's cross. It is where the sun refused to shine and the moon dripped like blood out on Calvary's cross is where they took Jesus down from that cross and buried him in Joseph of Arimathea's tomb. But there he was in that tomb for three days and three nights. That's why I'm so glad he didn't stay out on that cross but he paid the price for my sin debt. But early one Sunday morning, after three days, he got up with all power in his hand. And as long as Jesus got up with all power in his hand, and when he went back to heaven after walking here on earth, after he was resurrected, he left us with a comforter by the name of the Holy Spirit. And that Holy Spirit helps me to pay the price of praise. That Holy Spirit helps me to pay the price of persecution. The Holy Spirit helps me to pay the price of being ostracized. The the Holy Spirit helps me to pay the price of being criticized. That's why you don't have to attack everybody, but you just hold on to the word of God. And when you hold on to the word of God, and when you do like David says, and hide the word of God in your heart, you can pay the price because you know that one day you're going to a place where the wicked shall cease from troubling and the weary shall be at rest. You pay the price because you know you're going to a place whose builder and maker is God when you're willing to pay the price you pay the price because you know that if this earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved you got a new house not made with the hands of man when you're willing to pay the price you know that one day you'll see Jesus face in peace when you're willing to pay the price even as you navigate through this sinful world that we live in you still hold to God's unchanging hand and you know that he walks with you and he talks with you and it tells you that he's your own. That's why you can pay the price that God has set before you. See, I tell you, you may be going through some things and there's a price that must be paid, but it's well worth it. 
Because in the end, he'll say, well done, thy good and faithful servant. And I want you to understand that word servant. It is to be a slave for Jesus Christ. And I've seen some people stop serving the Lord during this pandemic because they cannot come to a physical building. They just stop serving the Lord. Now they think Sunday worship time is free time. It's time for them to do what they didn't have an opportunity to do all week long. It's time to go grocery shopping during worship time. It's time to go fishing during worship time. It's time to remodel the house and wash the car. I don't need worship service because we're not going to the building, so I can't worship God. If you need a building to worship God, I contend you've never worshiped God. One more time. If you need a building to worship God, I contend you never worship God because God is not confined to a building. And if because we are not in a building, you can't worship God, I contend that you need to check your relationship with God. God is not confined in buildings. How do you know that? Well, if you read John chapter 4 and verse number 24, that is the same, that is the same issue that they had. And many times we draw a conclusion based upon what we think, and it has absolutely nothing to do with Scripture. And then on that presupposition and that conclusion, we live our life and think we're pleasing to God because that's what we think and that's what we feel. But look, let, let, let me help you with this real quick because we, we got some people. I know it ain't nowhere else in this country, but we got some people here in Atlanta who feel like, we got some people here at Simpson Street who feel like they can't worship God because the building is, because the building is not open. If you understand anything about Scripture, and, and first of all, we're going to pray for you because you, 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 you need prayer. And I'm not mocking you. You, you, you just need prayer because God is not, God is not confined to a building. Look, look at John chapter 4 and verse number 24. I'm going to give you this and I'm going to be finished. And, and, and I tell those who have, who have grasped this that sometimes the price that you will pay is being criticized by those who have not gotten it. See, some folk who don't have it will criticize those who do. If, if you look at John chapter 4 and verse number 24, uh, look, look, look at verse number 19. The Bible says, the woman said unto him, sir, I perceive that thou art a prophet. Our fathers worship in this mountain. See, that's physical. And you say that in Jerusalem is the place wherein men ought to worship. Okay? This, this is the woman uh, talking to Jesus. Jesus said unto her, verse 21, woman, believe me, the hour cometh when we shall neither, watch this, in this mountain, this physical place, nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. Those are physical places. Ye worship, ye know not what. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. Watch this, verse 23. But the hour cometh, and now is, when the true worshipers <laughs> shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth, has nothing to do with the physical address. It says the true worshipers will worship him in spirit and in truth, for the Father seeketh such to worship him. So that even if you cannot come to this 800 Joseph E. Boone Northwest Mountain, you can still worship God because true worshipers can sit in their living room and still worship God because they're worshiping him not at the mountain, but they're worshiping him in spirit and in truth. The case is now closed. 
I've worshiped God today. And there's nothing in this building but a camera and one person. But I've worshiped God. And I feel so good about my worship to God. And you ought to call everybody you know who does not apparently understand the scripture that worshiping God is not about a mountain, but it is about the presence of God in their life. Be willing to pay the price to worship God. If there's someone here this morning and you need prayer, listen, we had so many people to ask for prayer last week. What a blessing. People email me from all over the country asking me to pray for them for certain things in their life, certain things going on. And, and we took time out to pray for them. And I believe by faith things change when prayer goes up to God. We want to pray for you and pray with you. Some of you are paying the price. And it seems like it's too much to pay. But let me tell you something. It may not be easy, but it's always worth it. And if you're here and you need to put the Lord on in baptism, you come by hearing the word of God, believe in what you heard, be willing to repent of your sins, confess Jesus Christ to be the son of God, and we will baptize you for the remission of your sins. And I just believe also there are some sitting out there who are members of the body of Christ you need to get your life right with God. Stop being distracted by everything else. Stop being distracted by what people say, what people do, what people think. You need to get right with God. Because when death comes knocking on your door and you have to give an answer to the things you've done, you will stand before the judgment bar of God all by yourself. We pray that you've enjoyed this message the price of praise. Are you willing to pay the price to put God first in your life? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they were willing to pay the price. They said he may not deliver us, but we know he's able. When you have a mindset, God may not bring me out of it, but I know he's able, you're paying the price. May God bless you, and may he bless you extremely well. Sweet. I know he's sweet, I know, and you know that storm for life may rise. You know the strong winds may blow, and you know that I'll tell the world. I will tell him wherever I go. I will tell them that. to another portion of our worship service, which is giving, and it involves our contribution, giving back to our to our God. So it means that God has, he has blessed us so much that we have an opportunity to give back of our means. And uh, our example for uh, giving is taken out of uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 6 through 8, and it reads, But this I say, he which soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly, and he which soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. For every man as he purposed in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth the cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that ye always having all sufficiency in all things may abound to every good work. Shall we pray? Almighty God in heaven, we have taken this opportunity to thank you, Father, for all the blessings you give us in our lives, the money that we have, the homes that we live in, the clothes that we wear, Father, everything that you give us comes from comes from you. And we're so thankful for that, Father. And we give this opportunity, we have this opportunity, Father, to give back a reasonable portion of those things you have blessed us with, uh, so that the kingdom the work here at the kingdom will be will be completed. Continue to be with us, strengthen us, and guide us. For this is our prayer in your son's name. Amen. Jesus, my heavenly King, love me, I know. Praise to him, I sing, on what I go. Closely to 
to him my painless sing still flow. I love my Savior too. I love my Savior. He loves me too. Yes, he loves me too. And as we go into another item of worship, which is our communion, we do this on the first day of every week, and uh, I'll be taken from Scripture, First Corinthians, verses chapter eleven, verses twenty-three through thirty, and it reads as follows: For I have received also, I received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was portrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also, he took the cup. And when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do you as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death until he comes. Therefore, whosoever shall eat of this bread and drink of this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself. So let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, eateth and drinketh damnation unto himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this cause many are weakly and sickly among you, and many sleep. Shall we pray? Almighty God in heaven, we have taken this opportunity, Father, to come to your throne, remembering the sacrifice of your darling son, Jesus Christ, who died on the cross that we might have a right to the tree of life. Father, we take these emblems that represent his shed blood and broken body in a manner that's well-pleasing and acceptable unto you. For this is our prayer in your son's name. Amen. Shall we partake of the Lord's Supper? Amen. I once was lost in sin, but Jesus took me in, and then a little light from heaven filled my soul. Well, it made my heart in love, and wrote my name above. Now just a little talk with Jesus makes me whole. Well, I let us have a little talk with Jesus. Jesus makes it right. Sometimes my past seems drear, but without a ray of tears, and then a cloud of doubt may hide the light of day. The mist of sin may rise, and I hide the starry sky. Just a little talk with Jesus and let us go away. Well, let us have a little talk with Jesus and let us tell him all about our joy. Oh, you will. Oh, you know that it will answer by and by. Well, you feel a little crap for yearning as your heart and heaven is turning. You will find a little talk. Jesus makes it right. Well, I let us have a little talk with Jesus. And let us tell him all about our joy. Oh, you will hear my face. Oh, you know. 